No, we were talking about after film school, which is uh, yeah. you're living it, man. I don't know about that, but well, you're you're you stayed in L.A. You went to film school and you you figure out how to stay in L.A. and continue doing what you know what you wanted to do and and beyond, right? And that you're directing too now. That is true. Um, I think honestly, I was very green coming to AFI. Producing that track was the only track that made sense with my sort of background. What was and your background? All the other, uh, well, I worked in finance. My, my okay. undergrad was in theology. And then I went and worked in finance. And then I had a YouTube channel where a video went viral and ended up on a film set. And so that producer convinced me to go to grad school yeah, for film. Because I was going to go to NYU to do politics. Uh -huh. Which would have been bizarre timing. 2015-ish oh, yeah. for politics. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait. You, you, so you were early on YouTube and you had a, a viral video go. Yeah, so when, I don't know if you I don't know if you were there for this, but when AFI did that thing at the beginning where everyone played like a little clip from their their yeah. past, yeah, real day. And I'm watching I'm watching all of these unbelievable clips. I'm like, oh my god, what have I done? Because I put like a 45 second clip of me doing a prank, a YouTube prank, and I'm like, I'm fucked, I'm fucked. I'm gonna day one, everyone's gonna think I'm a complete, you know, because AFI is quite, you know, it's renowned. They're, they're serious a, filmmakers. They're they're, they're serious, very serious. They're artists, serious people. But yeah. actually, after an hour of like very, very like incredibly beautiful, but quite sort of sad and often melancholic film, this one little prank video I think was was welcomed because it was a little bit of a, a bit of levity. I remember Maddie Cruz just like crying with laughter. I was like, all right, well at least I got one person on my side. <laughs> <laughs> that, Maddie's a good one to get on your side, right? That's a well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah. you're right. Because that's like an eight to. 12 hour day of watching everyone's work. I remember because I, I used to be like the MC person of that. And uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of very serious, heavy stuff. So you always needed those, those little palate cleanser fun ones. There you go. Yeah. So, palate cleanser is the word, I think. You didn't know, but that's why you did really well. So wait, so did, were you, did, did you become famous? Like when you, not, not at AFI, for but. For one day we were on Good Morning America. That was actually the clip I showed was the Good Morning America clip. Um, and we were on today and I was doing my exams in London. So they invited us to come on the show, but I, I would have had to basically fu like flunk my exams. So I didn't. Um, yeah. So, and then what happened was, which is, I find this interesting as like a broader thing with filmmakers and everybody in the whole world. All of it has got like 300 views, 400 views. We were like famous on, on our campus. And then we always joked this video would get millions. And then it did. And we were paralyzed. We only released one more video after that because the other two guys in our little trio, and me to it to an extent too, I won't put it all on them, were like terrified the next video had to be better than the previous one. Right. And I feel like that's a film thing, right? You can make go make, I don't know, Alien, like Ridley Scott did, and then he suddenly has to like beat that. You know, yeah. and I think everybody, every movie he's done since is like, well, it's not Alien or it's not Gladiator. I'm not trying to pick on Ridley, he's a great filmmaker, but I'm just right. saying, I think that's a lot of pressure. To, to, to emulate that. I mean, even Jordan Peele, Get Out was so good. That bar was set so high. Yeah. That's kind of, that's a tough, it's a tough feeling, I think. But you also, you feel it, you feel when you watch their next movies, you know, and you would probably feel it if you saw your next videos, you feel them chasing it, right? In that there's a similarity to it. And then sometimes they get it out of their system and then they change what they're doing. But um, right. yeah, I mean, like, like you wanted to do it, but you were frozen with, what do we do? Yeah. And yeah. honestly, if we just had been been a little braver and just put all our videos on the thing, we probably would have just slowly become a. I'd probably be like a YouTube millionaire right now. I'd, I'd be I'd be Logan Paul and I'd be selling like Monster Energy drinks wherever he does. You'd be fighting, yeah, some uh, uh, other MMA guys and uh, exactly. Yeah, he's done all right. Well, there, then also there were those. Uh, who were the famous pranksters that started on YouTube that had their own show? Um. Uh, oh. I should know this. I, it's like um, three guys. Well, it's it's like what you were doing, but they're, they're it's a prank show. Are they the guys who just they were the, they weren't like um they weren't right as SNL or anything, were they? they no, no, not those no, guys. No, no, no. They're literally okay. uh, they're doing um they do prank videos, uh prank, prank, yeah, prank. Are they on show on YouTube? Prank well, guys, there's gonna be a lot. Of well, this is all gonna be edited, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This will be curious, for. Uh, this will be for Renee. It's definitely a tr out. prank trio. It's a prank trio, is it? What are they call TV show? Uh, dude, they're all everywhere. Anyway, <laughs> you're not talking about impractical oh, impractical jokers. jokers. Impractical okay, jokers. Impract absolutely. 
Yes. Those guys were our heroes, 100%. Oh, yeah. so they were already doing it when you were... They were already... They just... Uh, yeah, they just... Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And did you do um, a real prank or did you do a staged prank? All real. It's funny you say that. I was about to say, this was the era where like... It's going to sound ridiculous me saying this. This is when the prank... This was the golden era of pranking where everything was real. And then what happened was because of the, all the kind of the competition of pranks and having to do like an even more in- insane one, then people started staging them. So they could do like insane things, which were basically just criminal, to be honest with you. Um, and they weren't fun. Like no one's having fun. People are like, th- people being chased with this, like, a, a, I don't know, chainsaw. That's not fun. That's just like really scary. Our videos were very like family friendly. It's a Star Wars related prank as well. It's really simple. It's, we're in an elevator. This is the one that went viral. We're in an elevator. I don't know if you've ever done this as a kid. You press the button and they would open the door again and obviously wind up all the adults. So we were those kids. I would go inside. I wore like a sort of hood thing. And I would just do this with my hands. And my buddy, out, my buddy outside would press the button at the right time and the door would open. And that was the entire thing. And the camera was right in front of the lift. No one saw it. And everyone was just looking. It's like a, mag- a magician. They just see me with my hands. They don't yeah. stick their head out to see a guy. And the reactions were, that's the funny part. It's not even the prank. It's the reaction. Yeah, you're right. Because like, right, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't understand. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. like when you see people react to magic, that's the joy of magic, right? Agreed. Yeah. And that was so funny that that was the prank because I still do when I walk into a grocery store, you know, and it's like automatic. I always do that. I go, you know, oh yeah, well, well, exactly. Everyone's done it. So I think that helps too. Everybody's done that. Uh, (laughs) And it it took, we would do, we would spend days planning pranks. We'd do hours and hours and it would go nowhere. This one we did in 20 minutes. We had a different idea where I was going to be a zombie that would come out and run at people, which is mean. And I was like, why don't we just do the door thing? He's like, that's not going to work. I'm like, let's just do it. Did it in 20 minutes. Went and had a pint upstairs edited it in like an hour, put it on YouTube, went to bed like a few days later um, when we uploaded it. And I woke up to like half a million views from like nothing the day, night before. It was crazy. It That's was crazy. Crazy. And what did it get up to? Like, uh, let's see. Oh. Uh, Star, Star Wars elevator prank. <laughs> um, it's at uh, four and a half million. Oh my god! The coolest That's thing like, that happened, yeah, was sorry, was Star Wars's official Twitter page tweeted it. <laughs> that was the coolest thing. That's the biggest. That's the cool. That's the endorsement, man. I honestly couldn't believe it. Yeah. Anyway, that's so great, man. I love it, and that's so like out of the movies too. You know, like when the the young band has their their hit single on the radio, and they're like, "What?" Like that overnight success thing. So. So you were doing all the filmmaking things. You were like shooting it and editing it and all that. I was, I was more, I wasn't, I was filming it, but I was never, the editor was another guy who, it was three of us. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was more of the, I was more the prank, uh, prank star, I guess. I was more in the videos doing the stuff. I was the guy in the lift. So right. I'm like, yeah, gone. But was it ever a, a thing that you were going to like go into acting be in front of a camera? So actually, since I got my green card last, not last Halloween, Halloween before, I have been doing a bit of acting. So I've done a few short films I just did another feature last summer that I was actually one of the leads in. So I have done a little more. I get, I, I always enjoyed doing the pranks so much. And, and obviously it's not acting in a very traditional sense, but there is a lot of, there is an element of it, of acting for sure. Yeah. So um, well, I it's, really it's, a, it's almost a higher level of difficulty because you have to stay in character in front of people that are not actors, you know? That's true. Uh, I remember, I, I don't remember, I won't tell you this. I don't want this one on the podcast. So I won't, I won't mention this prank. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i managed to prank oggy i pranked oggy he told i did we did a really really juvenile video and he's like there's no way i'd fall for that no way i'm like okay do you see the game last night oggy did you see it he's like oh yeah and so we talk about it for like 30 seconds and then i do the prank on him and the look he gives me of terror of what the prank is he, he 30 seconds later he fell for it so i it was that was that was that was quite vindicating because it, it, it did show I can still, I've got a pretty good poker face. You still got, yeah, yeah. You know, um, doesn't help me in poker. We play poker every week. You should come, by the way, one week. Ryan and I host a poker game. Ryan's still oh, yeah. my roommate. My, my common law husband, Ryan. I've Scrooge. heard about this. Yes, yes. You too. Living in sin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. No, I don't want to play with some guys that, that are professional pranksters. <laughs> Take all my money. I mean, we never win. Ryan and I never win. I've never won it. <laughs> So you're not that good of an actor. All right, so you're you're no. now finally embracing the acting side. But let's but let's go back to the filmmaking side. Yeah, sure. sure. So, what inspired go? You know, taking it seriously and going to like an MFA film program. 
Um, I always knew I wanted to move to the States. As I said, I was going to go to NYU for politics. This prank got me, uh, there was a producer who like knew my dad very, very vaguely. He saw it and I guess he recognized me. I don't know quite how. And so he's like, does your son do social media stuff? Like, is he a social media kind of person? And he said, yes, which is not true. Um, I met with the guy and he basically hired me as a social media guy on his film for free. But I got to fly to Canada, basically producer's assistant on a feature. It was an indie feature, probably like two mil in Canada. And I was the best month ever. I mean, I just, it's a starry eyed kid going there. You know what I mean? And right. he every day was like, don't go to do politics, do film, do film. And I was like, nah, I don't think so. And then I got back to England and I missed it so much. I called him. I was like, I think I'm going to do it. He's like, good. I already wrote your reference. Here's the five film schools you should apply to. And he just texted me like USC, AFI, UCLA, Columbia or something like that. Um, and that was it. And, and I looked into the programs and I realized actually I was not a very eligible person because of the way you need to have a reel, all this kind of thing. So yeah. AFI's producing program was definitely the most logical. And I, I don't know if you'd agree, but I feel like the interview for AFI's producing program is kind of the main thing. Would you, I don't know. It just feels like basically you have, well, back then it was Betsy and Neil and they'd basically like, can this person handle the stress of producing an AFI film? Yeah. That, that was always, that's always like the focus of that. Like, you know, are they going to crack? You know, are there any, <laughs> look for any kind of like mental, you know, instabilities. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they're hidden very well. Cause as you know, a lot of those people get through, um, but yeah, you're looking, you're, yeah. If you're at the level of your get to the interview, then you're good on paper, but now it's like, okay. it's personality right. and yeah, you know, sussing out your level of, can you, what can you handle? But, but, but as you know, that interview isn't, is not enough to, 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 to match, to mirror, to what it, the experience actually is. No, not at all. Um, and I was cycle one, week one. Oh my God. So I didn't, I didn't have any of the benefits of like, hey guys, what was that house you used last week for your film shoot or whatever? It was all very much, you know, and I, had a, I, had a, I don't know, I had a, not a tough team, but I had a very serious team as well. But I think that was good. I think I, think I benefited. It behooved me. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that yeah. I always think that, I mean, I've always heard that, they choose the the first you know productions to go out based on like who do they trust the most right who's not going to completely fail uh, so I don't know I don't know if that's true I don't know if I believe that I don't know maybe okay. <laughs> okay but you did it you survived you survived the first one mm -hmm. okay well talk about talk about coming to 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 AFI you had been to the states before or or did you come to LA just for uh, AFI yes yeah, so I came out I came out I met up one of the prank one of the other pranksters they were called we were called the Jester lads. So one of the other jesters went to Tufts. So mm. I visited him in Tufts uh, the summer before. Okay. Um, and I also came out to LA, I think, to sort of scope out LA a few months before AFI. Right. Yeah. Which right, is so, okay. impossible because you don't know what the hell you're doing. It's such a big city. I didn't have a car. And I was like, this sucks. Oh, right. You got a car right but, away, though, I assume. When I moved out properly, yeah. Pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 I don't know how they do it. More and more, though, the fellows don't have cars, you know, especially international fellows because of, uh, you know, Lyft and Uber is so prevalent, but still, yeah. I don't know, man. It's like, this is a city where just to be able to just jump in your car whenever you need to go somewhere. And especially when you're doing production and all that stuff. Anyway, I agreed. I agreed. Talk about being there. So you don't, you don't really have a film background, even though you worked on one film. Right. Um, yeah. and, but I'm just saying like, you, you know, like you were saying, you're sitting in that real day and you're watching, especially the cinematographer reels. And you're like, holy shit! The, you, why are you in film school? <laughs> These are like feature feature level, you know, quality. Yeah. Do you, do, we'll talk about was there any kind of imposter syndrome, or did you feel, you know, what was going through your mind or your heart? Um, uh, um, honestly, one hundred percent there was. Uh, I think I was lucky because on that the terrifying day where everybody has to team up, where well, I think you have like three or four days to team up. And everyone's sort of taking interviews and it's sort of like last person pick for the basketball team kind of terror. Um, I was really lucky because I teamed up. I think I was the second team to team up. Um, and I sort of didn't mess. I, I made, I try to make decisions. I guess it's kind of like how Mark Zuckerberg wears the same outfit over and over and over again to save himself stress. Mm -hmm. I do that. I, so I was like, I'm going to make this, these guys seem fine. This is team with these people. Great. Now I can at least get going on this thing. Oh, it's a one location movie. Great. You know what I mean? So I, I, mm. I think, and I also wasn't afraid to ask questions. Um, and I feel like some people at AFI were, especially if they had more experience because they felt like they were embarrassed to do so. Um, I leaned on Natalie and Betsy and everyone around me. And and being the first week, people didn't really know what they 
have expectations for like what people would what the roles were how they were a lot like assigned so for example I, I remember we had to do um for the permit we had to go like talk to all the neighbors and the screenwriter came with me to do that that never happened again like after a couple of weeks screenwriters was like hang on we don't have to help with this crap you know so, so the team my team was came together and everyone helped out because yeah. the lines hadn't been like they were they were they weren't defined as to what your roles were by the time you get to like cycle two the producers are doing everything right like everything that is re- related to production yeah. um I, I, it was all just moving so quickly i didn't i tried not to think about yeah. um that's it, the best way to deal much. with it though like the the not yeah. being afraid to ask questions and you're right the people that, that come in that think they know it all they are af- just afraid to, a- to ask questions and then they end up you know failing in certain areas yeah 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 absolutely well, so speaking um, of failure, like that's always the best way to learn, you know, I mean, mm, there's yeah. the experience is the experience, but learning from mistakes. So do you remember like, what was the biggest mistake you made early on or one of your cycles? Oh boy. Um, well, I took on, I did five cycles. I think that was I... an error. <laughs> yeah. Um, Whoa. I'm trying to think this. Were they really asking you to take on additional ones or did you volunteer? I remember I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time for one of them. <laughs> like I was in there like doing something else and Natalie's talking to Gianna about like, she needs a director, she needs a producer, she needs a producer. And she's like, well, who am I going to get? And then they look around the room and I'm there. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> and these, these girls work, they work me. They work me <laughs> immediately. That is so hard. funny. <laughs> that was on another cycle. That was just, that just happened. And what am I going to do? Go to call them like, actually I want to get off it. And you know what I mean? Um, I, I don't, I, I'm trying to think biggest mistakes. Um, was there any like big, honest, like, was there an intervention with Betsy or? A... Oh, no, that's true. Right. My my second, my second cycle one that had an intervention with a, with a therapist. And that was a horrible situation where like half the team's on one side and the other half the team's on the other side of the room. And it's like, sort of like, it was awful. I, and oh. I just, and I, yeah, I'm not going to name any names. No, you don't have to, um, but, but what was the therapist's role? Like, like a mediator? Yeah, yeah. So try. Let's talk about all these issues and um, and everyone on my side was just crying, and everyone on their side would. It felt like they were just like sort of very stony faced. Yeah. And I was just like, "What the hell's going on?" I need. To, I don't know how to. And I'm the producer on there. We had another producer as well. It was. Yeah. I, I. I mean, honestly, there's probably so many mistakes I made that I've repressed, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, I feel like that's what a lot of people did. They were like, all right, that's done now. I can move on. I think I was too hard on people, actually. When Betsy gave me my report, she, I expect, if I'm going to, I don't know, I expect a lot from people, I guess. And that's that's not fair, especially in cycle one, cycle two, when everyone's still learning. I think, and that probably pushed people away a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, certain producers in my, in my cohort. Um, and that would probably be the thing I would change. I would be less tough. Yeah. You know? On your, on that your, would be the, on because your other producers. Because the end of the day, yeah. I, I yes, because in the, the day, man, this is this is the whole the best thing about AFI is the network, right? Yeah. So those who went to AFI and were absolute nightmares and treated everyone like crap, fine. Maybe they got their special extra thing on the day that they wanted, but they, 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 when they leave AFI, they don't have those relationships or as many of those relationships. Yeah. To me, I was like, I need to, I need to make sure that I and I'm really glad Betsy pointed that out because I'm like the main thing is the relationships, and I still talk to like twenty or thirty people from my cohort, which I think is pretty good. Yeah. And you're living with one, right? I'm living with one. The other one seemed to basically live here anyway. Who's that? Like Gio. Gio sleeps over here all the time. Oh, you know, really? Gio. Yeah, no, but like it's mostly just because there's a karaoke bar down the street and he's like, all right, it's 2 a.m. Let's just, we'll just stay here. That's so funny. Anyway. <laughs> I won't bring it up since, uh, yeah. since I know we work together. Okay, so what was, uh, what was a big thing that you learned, though, over that, that first year? As far as like you didn't know coming coming in, whether it's technical, um, whether it's about the job, creative, about yourself. Um, I think, well, honestly, just from, from the ground up, everything to do with film production, I knew none of it. Like when I say none of it, absolutely none. I didn't know anything. I mean, obviously, I know you've got to eat food, you've got to get catering and all this kind of thing, but I just didn't even. I didn't even when I watched movies, I didn't even think about like the different takes and how many takes they were going to be in. How you know the, the, the what's the word um, coverage and all these kind of things? This is all I learned everything. Every single right. thing that happened was, and that is how green I was. I I was prob- possibly the greenest person, must have been in the top five greenest people at film school, at AFI, no doubt. 
Um, and then specifically, again, asking for help, but also like people, are, people do the power of the phone call is something that I learned from AFI. People love to email, they love to text, very impersonal. It can, people can misinterpret it. If you ask for a favor over an email or text, people are not nearly as receptive. Mm. I found that I would call everybody. Other producers might not and do lots and lots of emails. But if I need something from a location, like we fucked up, we need an extra day, we need a different day, I call them and like, look, I'm really sorry, I made a mistake. I really appreciate it. That was always my, the power of the phone call. And actually my very first director at AFI, a guy called Greg, he, I was worried he was like, wasn't, because it was all about like what people, what the directors would say to the other directors about how good you were as a producer. And I was worried that he might think I sucked because I was my first time. And apparently if I heard from another one, he's like, he's always saying you're awesome. He's like, every time I walk past George, he's on the phone. That means he's doing a good job. And there is a producing joke. I remember at, the, at our graduation, Jason walks in like he's on the phone. Dude, I totally remember that. It was one of my favorite things that someone's did on the camera. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it it's a producer amazing. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, that's everyone. That's the cliche in everyone's mind. Producers on the phone. Doing but it, whatever. It, making it, deals. For a reason. It's a cliche for a reason. I think yeah. that's, yeah. But you're right. Like, look, ultimately a producer is, it's all about communication, right? And I think there's a lot of wisdom in what you said, like, especially nowadays when things can be misinterpreted and people are getting lazy with their written communication, a phone call, like a phone call is so much more efficient. Now it used to be like, Oh, an email is more efficient. A text is more efficient, but now a phone call is because you're doing back and forth emails, back and forth texts. They're not getting it. You're just like, pick up the phone and just talk. And it takes a couple minutes and then you're done. And you yeah. have all the nuance of your voice and inflection and all the things you can't put into a, into a text. Uh, that's so smart. I could, yeah. I think I'm absolutely right. Yeah. Um, I'm all about the phone call. But it's so funny. Like, you know, that was when you went to school and now I, I look at the current generations and they're, they're even less, you know, into talking, you know, even to talking face to face. Um, I think, yeah. No, yeah. I've heard people literally say they get anxiety from phone calls. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I, sometimes when the phone rings, I'm like, oh God, who is it? Oh God, what's this number I don't recognize? <laughs> so I get, I get it, yeah. but it's, you know, it's very powerful, so. Yeah, I know, I, it's it's like, I, I always think like you've, you've made it in life if your phone rings and you don't even look at who's calling and you pick it up and answer. That means you've, you've yeah. like, you are at ease with everything. You have not screwed anyone over in your life. You don't owe anyone anything. That's a really, that's the, that's what we should all aspire to be. That's, that's a really good point. That's a good that point. That is enlightenment. Like, Did you even study is, that in theology? No, I should have. Um, yeah. I mean, you're right. Do I owe money to the person calling? Is it my angry ex-girlfriend? Don't have to worry yeah. about any of that. Right. Um, I, the lawyer that Ryan and I use, it's when I call, whenever we speak on the phone, it sounds like to me, his legs are up on his desk and he's holding like a pina colada on a beach or something. That's just the way he sounds. He sounds so relaxed. It's unbelievable. It's the <laughs> and best. I aspire for that. That's great. Yeah. I want to talk to this guy now. Yeah, I want to, I want to pick, uh, pick up on his nuances. Uh, okay, so yeah. let's talk about you. Then you go on to the second year. At what point do you start thinking like, what is my life going to be after school, right? And what was um, your vision of it? I think, I don't know how, who else you spoke to on this, but I think for the international fellows, so much of it was like, the, the focus is get the, get the visa, you know? Cause I know we've, lo we've lost a lot of people in my cohort, other cohorts to basically not being able to stay, which sucks. Um, so I feel like that was just driven home by AFI, by everyone around us. You've got to focus about like reverse engineering what you need for the visa, which meant like going to festivals of your film, getting news articles about your film, um, just trying to do every project you can and just get your hands in as many pots as possible um, and just sort of focus on all these things. And that was honestly what I did. So, you know, before I even thought about what I wanted to do, I knew that I wanted to do more than produce. Oggy was really kind. He let me write my cycle three with him. And then we wrote the thesis together. Wow. That was like my first step, which was great. And it kind of gave me a writing credit, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, and then I knew, I knew I was just like, let's just make stuff. I mean, I got to just make things because that's all the only option to get this visa. And that by that, it was like, a, in a way it was nice because it forced us to be in that position. So when Ryan and I graduated, we made our first feature. Granted, it only came out last week. So it took us five years after shooting it, which is a whole other story. Wait, but actually, we did it. We were like, like literally last week, like 
literally on Tuesday it came out, yeah. Less than a week ago. Well, congrats. Yeah. Thanks. But I mean, we did the whole thing way too rushed, made so many errors. Um, I'm really I had the best time of my life. We did it in seven days. Um it's a great anyway, I don't want to get into this if this is yeah, not yeah, relevant, yeah. but 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 like I just think I was very much like I'm very restless anyway. So like I just gotta make stuff. And that, and so I didn't think about some sort of grand plan of like this, then that, and like I'm gonna make a perfect movie that's like five million or ten million and it's gonna have these people and I was like, No, no I just wanna make things and yeah. I need to or I'm not gonna be able to stay here. Yeah. So that was kind of my mentality. Um it's smart. Yeah. It's smart. I, that's what yeah. Look, I mean, like you can make the most amazing thesis film, it, it, like short films launch careers, like, you know, what, 0.01% of the time. It's, it's, yeah. it, it's not what it used to be. I feel like that world. And uh, there's so much emphasis put on people's thesis films thinking that's the one thing that will get you there. But really, it's a really about like just making something that's like, a, you know, a feature film. And I want to say like a real film, but like a feature film and who cares? Right. It, nobody's going to watch it anyway. Right. So I, I always say like people in Hollywood, they don't read and they don't, they don't watch. So, yeah. but if you put it out there and it's on IMDb and if there's a, you know, press about it, that you made a feature film, they will talk to you and meet with you. And then you make the next one. And it's about I getting think you're absolutely right, mate. done fast. That's, which is, you know, what you yeah. did. And I, but well, we didn't get done. We got it shot fast. We got it we got shot fast, fast but, <laughs> we, but you, we at least literally... you, you got it out of the way and then you went on to the next one. You learned but, from that. Right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The next one only took three years. Um, but to your point, actually, talking about the thesis not being the be all and end all, I do feel like my director was one of the, he felt just like that. He's like, this is, yeah, it's going to be a big deal, whatever. First of all, we're making a sci fi action comedy, so it's not going to be like a festival, darling. Um, but he's, we were already but, talking about but, the feature version of it. But I will say, like, more commercial than most, uh, at least AFI thesis films, right? Absolutely. I mean, it, we just got our first paycheck from AFI because we've licensed it to like a few different sci-fi channels and stuff. That's really cool because really cool, that never happens. Yeah, yeah. That, exactly. Um, so, but he always had like the, you know, it was like, could Dread Space become a feature? Um, and at the end of the day, it's just a, it's just a short film. And it's not going to like, you know, we shouldn't, this is great, but like, let's remember this is, if we put all our eggs in this basket and all our hopes and dreams in this basket, it's going to be, there's a recipe for being crushed. Yeah. And I think that made the stakes lower as well for making the thing. My second year was was just so chill because of that, because of these lower stakes. Although the project was extremely production heavy and stunts and VFX and all sorts of things, what all the collaborators were so relaxed. That's the main thing. The people yeah. are, the, are always going to be your biggest kind of thing to deal with, I think. Yeah, if you didn't have to deal with people, it'd be much easier to make movies. Well, okay, okay. Tough people. Stress, no, you're right. Stress no, people. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you made you made something that was fun though, right? Yeah, which I'm I'm proud of. I'm really proud of that film, honestly. I think it's so much fun. We got like again, funny enough, ended up on YouTube as a sci-fi channel called Dust. And it got like they keep it's annoying. They keep deleting it and re-uploading it every year. I don't know why they do this. But the first like, time they uploaded it, it got like a million views. So fuck. That's a pretty well seen thesis film, you know, in my mind. Oh, um, oh my god, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. They don't get that yeah. kind of exposure. Well, you're not allowed to put it on YouTube anyway, so like that that limits it usually. Right. But, but like Ari right. Aster's movie is out there on so many different channels and has millions of views. But like that, and that's part of the reason he became he was able to make features, you know. Right. Um, um, and it just seeing like some like comment like, "I'm a grandfather. This really makes me think of my son. I cried watching this." You're like, "All right, I feel good. I yeah. can I can probably just die happy now." <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, well, talk about that. Talk about the, uh, you know, we make films for audiences, right? That's the whole reason mm -hmm. we do this. When you first started, well, you got that reaction when you put a, a viral prank video up. So is that when you first got hooked on it? And then talk about, you know, like what it feels like to get like the comment you just said for something you created and, and something you co-wrote. I'm thinking, I've been thinking a lot about what I want out of the films in terms of reaction and what, to, for me and everything like that and one of my favorite filmmakers is a, is a guy called mark duplass i'm sure you know the Plas, the Plas brothers and there's all these different metrics for a successful movie making millions of dollars you know having crazy stars going to sundance whatever it might be and he says his only metric now is making a movie that he would be proud to show his kids when they grow up and i was like dang that's a pretty cool metric um i think i can get behind that 
And so, yeah, and I think I think when you try and make it for other reasons, you it loses its heart and soul. Um, I had another movie. So the movie, I, the, the, so I guess there's been two features that I've sort of done that have been my main focus since graduating. And the second one, that was an absolute, it was very chaotic, let's just say that. It was made during COVID with my ex-partner. We broke up during the film, which made things very interesting. I'll just leave it at that. But it came out and one of the reviews basically said, this movie is extremely flawed, um, but it has this heart to it that a Hollywood film could never get. I was like, dang, that is the review I didn't know I wanted. And I think that's true. <laughs> and Ryan made, it, Ryan made a movie like that where it didn't get crazy critical reviews, but it has so much heart and I can feel that heart. Yeah. And there's something really cool about that, I think. Anyway. Oh, I, I'm with you, man. That That's special. And that's, you don't even know how to chase it, but that's the thing that you wanted. That's the reason that you keep making it hopefully yeah yeah um but you did so we don't need to talk in detail about that experience but that was something you directed right what what the the, the one the, that I... the feature with your ex-partner yeah yeah so yeah so we're doing we were in covid we were locked down in florida we were having a tough time and we're like how should we distract ourselves well we could have you know do the classic thing and have a baby to save a relationship or we could make a movie thank you for uh, making the first a movie. one did that yeah, yeah, I didn't actually, we didn't really discuss, but it was felt like that. It did feel like yeah. that was the sort of, uh, <laughs> and yeah, so that one was 2020, I guess it was started. And then mm -hmm. it came out and it's end of last year. So, so, but that was your first time directing, right? No, my first one was, was, was the one I did right out of AFI with Ryan, the one in seven days. Oh. So, so what happened, so what happened was right out of AFI, um, Ryan tried to get this film off the ground and it, and basically it kept falling apart. And he, he has a relative whose company bought this factory in the Midwest that was completely abandoned. And I was like, dude, that looks a cool location. Can we, can we just ask maybe they can not shoot that until when they renovate it? Obviously no, but I, was like, ah, I got this other project, fell through. And he's like, I'm gonna, call my, I'm gonna call my relative, calls him, comes back in the room and goes, all right, they're gonna renovate in six weeks. I'm like, okay, well, well fuck then. He's like, no, no, I'm gonna go downstairs now and I'm gonna write a script and I'm gonna, deliver it to you in two days I'm like what the what's it gonna be about and he's like it's gonna be about an ai 1980s ai we'd watch like ter we'd watch like terminator and predator recently i think uh it's gonna be about a 1980s ai and two bank robbers who uh, are on the run and they turn this ai back on when they're in the factory i'm like okay and he's like you go find a film crew we can only afford like six people and and basically what happened was so in the six week window of that phone call we did four weeks of writing and prep and then we went to Illinois and we shot the movie in seven days. Alessia from AFI was the DP. We had an AFI editor. We had a sound guy who did like my AFI films. We had a local guy who did like everything. Uh, and then two other people on the whole crew. And that was it. And we're in this factory and we shot it in like seven days. And oh, the other thing he said was, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna produce together. I'm gonna go write it right now. You're gonna direct it. I didn't even like pitch myself. Yeah, that's the, the part I'm curious about. How did that happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, that's, that was, that was an executive decision made by Ryan, the producer. He's like, we're producing together, you're directing. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, because we can't, we can't be fucking around with some other AFI director who's going to be like, let me do a whole pitch deck. Let me like, what, you know, do all this shit. You know, no, no, seriously. I know exactly like, what you mean. It's yeah. not, it's not going to work. Every other AFI director is going to freak out that we have to shoot in four weeks time. You won't. I'm like, well, I am actually. He's like, okay, I'll go down. I'll see you later. I'm going to write it now. So I had to call up these people and be like, yeah, it's about AI. Like, can you send this script? Like, uh, in like two days, I can. <laughs> it was bizarre, but it was honestly crazy. That was the craziest four weeks ever. Well, six weeks ever. Okay, um, so I didn't know. What, I didn't know about yeah. this. This is crazy, and it's so it's it's the Mark Duplass model. He always says, like, look around you, look at the locations you have available to you, and write something to that. And you did that. That's exactly what Ryan did. Ryan was the, Ryan had been to the location once, and so. He did that, but unfortunately, he wrote interior warehouse for every single scene, even though all the scenes were different like, locations. So when we got there, we're like, where in this giant warehouse? You know what I mean? So we had to like find, he would like describe the rooms as like interior warehouse room one or like interior warehouse like engine room, but there'd be like six of the engine rooms. So Leslie and I had to like go around and like basically place all the different things to those locations. Because we look at the script and we're like, and Leslie's like, I don't know how we're going to do this. And we had, to, had a whiteboard and we wrote all the different things down. And then we went around on this golf cart and we're like, this looks like it could be the location, right? The blocking would work. And then no one else knew where they were except us. So every time we went to these locations, Alessia had to go on one golf cart and me and the other. 
because we were the ones who actually knew where the locations were. This thing is like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of acres, not like tens of thousands of acres. It was enormous. And it's a Mitsubishi your, car you factory. You had your run of it? Like you were the, it's just like you yeah. were, oh my it's God. It's a that's Mitsubishi, amazing. an abandoned Mitsubishi car factory. So wow, everything was left. Mitsubishi laid off like 10,000 workers and they were like walked out by security. People left all their personal belongings, like pictures of their loved ones. It looked, the production design was absolutely insane because it looked like how we wanted it to look, an abandoned factory. Um, nuts. And then all the equipment and, of like the things that make everything. Cars, like... And they had like 20 guys who were working there who were like, basically it's bought by another car company. And those guys were like, they're sort of setting it up, but they were, we never saw them. They were like, it's such a big place. But they turned the robots on for us and stuff like that, <laughs> um, which was cool. And we joked that um, this production designer was Mitz, short for Mit Mitsubishi. So we'd be like, oh, Mitz, Mitz did a great job here. And eventually on our IMDb and on the credits, when it says production designer, we've got Mitz Bishi. So people oh, are like, that oh, is this brilliant. I freaking You're like this some Japanese production designer. <laughs> Who is this Japanese guy? <laughs> I, the movie's yeah. going to do really well. People are going to want to hire this person. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably the best part of the movie, honestly, because everything else was, it's very, it is very run and gun, and but the production design is fantastic. I, okay, so uh, it's called Project Dorothy. I'm looking at it on IMDb. Um, yeah, we, we haven't got the best rain yet. I'll be honest. Let's see. <laughs> well, I'm so excited to see it now. Just, I just love the story behind it. Okay, let me ask you this. Did Ryan actually finish a script in three days? Yeah. Wow. He did. That's amazing. Good for him. Uh, and then I'm, I assume you both kept working on it you know, up until shooting. Uh, yeah. Well, it was yeah. mostly producing. We did, I, I ended up coming in as a co-writer and I rewrote the third draw, third, third act. Mm -hmm. um, but he's definitely the main, his story by and everything like that. Um, right. And and then we did it and then we were, we just got in po Basically, we had all these VFX. I think we had like 300, 400 VFX shots. And we were trying to do it at the, the price point of the movie, which was like, we shot the whole thing for like 25 grand or something, production. Oh. Uh, yeah. So That's the whole incredible. thing is, well, yeah, I mean, it was seven people for seven days. You don't have to, you know, yeah. everyone's getting I see, I'm looking at uh, IMDb. It says uh, Ryan was the first AD. So everybody was. Ryan was the first AD and the scripty and the producer <laughs> and the UPM. He was a lot. That was, yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah. Uh, and you, yeah, had a, and you, know, that, you had legit, I mean, Daniel Harris is a, is a well-known actress. So she's the, she's the AI, the voice of the AI. Oh, she's the voice. Okay, so she's not. She wasn't there. Yeah, um, no, she was not. And yeah. then you had Alicia. Was that Alicia's first movie? Yeah, as cinematographer. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, talk about that. That learning curve of directing now, um, in this like you know ticking clock oof. mode. Uh, I like called up. Speaking of phone calls, I called up all the directors I knew and asked for that. Just try to give me all the tips you can. I wrote them on a note notes on my phone. Read some directing books um we what was a good what was a really good piece of wisdom you got from someone a little um don't cut don't cut the camera when you want to cut the camera cut like five seconds afterwards because those can be the best moments of an actor's performance yeah and or, don't be afraid to use stuff before you've called action if the actor isn't like looking at the camera and clearly you know and so that was that was more of i guess an edit note but you needed to know that before going into the film so you didn't call cut too early and yeah. I do that all the time. I kept doing that. And the actors would sort of, they would, and then oftentimes they would then maybe like do something completely different because they knew they were given license to do that. A lot of ad-libbing. Um, the actor who played Tim, who's the older guy, was, is a tough bastard. He, Ryan was scared of him the entire shoot, which was hilarious. And when we turned up on set, not even on set, we turned up at the Hotel Ramada next to the location where we stayed for like the two weeks, took over the whole place. They were like, what the hell's going on? Um, he sits us down in like the little lobby with the script. He's like, all right, we're going to rewrite this now. I'm like, that was terrifying. He's like, yeah, this dialogue doesn't make any sense. Because the guy was, his character was from Cincinnati, like a rough working class dude. Turns out Tim was a rough working class dude in Cincinnati. Mm. I wouldn't say this. I wouldn't say this. And so he, we went through every single line, crossed them out, changed the lines, did like a table read. It was invaluable. Yeah. Invaluable, that, that thing. And then these were the only three scripts that had all that. And we lost two of them. So there's just one script that was like our Bible that had the right lines by the end. Just dirty as hell. That was the script. Couldn't even afford copies, like a copy machine? Like. Well, because we know because we've written it all down on with, you know what I mean? We have to, oh, just, to, say, to, oh like, you're just going off of like handwritten notes? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So we were just we had the physical scripts and we just crossed stuff out. Yeah. And and then on the day they were like super responsible for for their um continuity because like we had like four looks for them and varying levels of blood and dirt and like sometimes and Ryan bless him was the AD but also the scripty but Ryan's not the guy for that. I love him but he's I mean he's not a scripty. He's just not that guy. Well, he's do um, I don't want to say ADD but he's you know. It's just, you know, he's Ryan. I he love him. He wants to do a little bit of everything. Yeah, you got to be so focused for yeah. scripting. Yeah. Uh, well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the best, but the most depressed, the lowest morale on the movie was we're doing the opening shot. There was this bag that in some scenes they had the bag, some scenes they didn't. That was the biggest continuity issue. Anyway, we get, I'm, taking, I'm being a director about this one, actually. I'm like, we're taking some time on it. And Les is like, dude, what are we doing? He's like, no, this is an opening shot. Anyway, they do this, they do this run. They kind of fall. They get picked up and they keep running. And we do it like, a bunch of times and i'm like we get one that's fantastic in my mind and i'm like guys we could do it a thousand more times it'll never been there that was absolutely perfect and everyone's like thank you and then ryan goes hey guys we forgot the bag so i've just said there's no way in a, we could do a thousand more takes and it could never be better and then the actors obviously like they're like well the, so we're, we're, it's gonna be bad then i'm like no oh, we can we can get it like good and he's like you just said there's no way it could be the other thing that someone told me was always be affirmative, like say really good, really good at the end of every take and then go, but let's try this. Yeah. So I would say brilliant, which is a very British word I've been told, yeah, saying yeah, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> every single take almost I'd say it to the point where Tim again was like, this is ridiculous. I could go over there, pull my pants down and pee on this bush on camera and he'd tell me it was brilliant. Well, that's the other lesson so, to learn is like that every actor, there's a different communication style, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wow. they were, they were, they were they were really nice. I, with no shot list either. So Alexa and I made everything up, every single scene, made it up as we went. Was that because just lack of time? Yeah, yeah. lack of time, but also actually it kind of made sense because there was so much there's so much flexible. We were just being flexible throughout. Every element of it was was flexible, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I think Alec, kind of like the same way Ryan was like, we can't hire get an AFI director because they're going to freak out. There weren't very many AFI DPs who we felt would be able to do this. Oh yeah. And Ryan had worked with. He'd worked the lesson on, on her thesis, uh, well, their thesis, and I, so that was. He's like, I think she can do it. Yeah. So. Oh, I'm yeah. excited to see it. I, I've always been just a fan of hers because I think she's just so cool and chill. She's um, extremely cool. It would have yeah. to be to be on that movie, I assume. Honestly, uh, yeah, she was. She just took, yeah, and she was wouldn't the one or two times where I got a little bit, tiny bit divery. She's like, don't be a diva. She's very Russian. Which helped. I think we needed a rush. Oh yeah, they're set. just like direct and cold, and like they just say it how yeah. it is, which you, you need sometimes on a film. Yeah. Was there a moment, yeah. you know, making that where you were like, you said something to an actor that snapped? Was it a moment where you were like, oh, I am a director. You were like, I got um, this. I think it was more. I, I felt more, more in the honestly with my collaboration with with Alessi was was what my favorite part was. I think visually, I feel pretty happy about the movie. Um, I think watching some of the playback in vi- like uh, dailies, I was like, "Oh, this is good. I feel good about this." Mm-hmm. Um, I g- yeah, I mean, I guess just keeping up with Tim, keeping up with Tim, this guy like, studied under Meisner and stuff like that. Keeping up with him was made me feel that way. There wasn't necessarily a particular moment where I felt like that, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. I felt more like that on the next film because I just felt like I'd had more time to. It, it felt I would. I want to. It's gonna. This is like. I don't want to sound like false modesty, but even in, it's now, I would call myself a filmmaker more than a director, and I feel like that's a diplo- market class thing too. Well, what do you? I don't know. What's the I, difference I, I, in your mind? Um, well, in this in this case, I was doing so many different roles. I wasn't just the director, so that's kind of the more sort of practical definition. But also, just I feel like this. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm. I, I think the the collaborative process is is the is essential for me at least i'm never gonna be the person who can be an auteur any kind of way so i don't know i just and also i still produce and i write and i act so more just generally speaking i am a filmmaker i guess i don't know if there's like you like doing it all you like you like doing i like doing it all i'm happy to produce it all i still do what they do which is reverse engineer the last film we did we shot at this house the next (laughs) the one in the middle we shot at the house in florida you know we we found a forest nearby We, we made forest scenes yeah. You found, you know what I mean? It's just all done like that model. Um, I like it. So are you, are you yeah. and Ryan officially like partners? 
everyone thinks we are, um, but, but we've only actually made one. Well, we've made one movie together, like like properly made it together. The one I recently did, he came on as a producer, mm. but like not he wasn't as involved. And then we have a third project that we're kind of both producing, but like we're very we're quite hands off in terms of we're not line producing it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, yeah. So he most of our both our projects have not been with each other. That's probably the easier way of putting it. Yeah. I think um, we live together. It's a lot. It'd be a lot to be working together all the time too. I, <laughs> I never knew how these like married couples, like my first job was with Kathy Kennedy and Frank Marshall and they're huge producers and they're married. I'm like, man, you guys need a break from each other. Come on. Uh, that's yeah. the joy of it. Right. Then you like, do your own thing. Um, I was going to say yeah. like you, going back to, you know, like when you became a director, like if you won over this guy, Tim, like Meisner trained actor and and then he's at by the end of that he's listening to you taking direction from you and respecting you then that you you have achieved directing yeah i think i gave it back to him as almost as good as he gave it to me which would probably helped yeah. you know yeah. what i mean we'll that's probably what he, what he wanted it. that's that's when he respects yeah. you right yeah yeah um he knew i cared a lot he knew i would give them if they wanted to do another take and i even if we're in a rush i'd give it to them um I was just, I, I, the same way I'd ask questions at AFI, I didn't have any kind of, like, I'm better than you guys. I know what I'm talking about, blah, 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 blah. And if I really disagree with them, guys, guys, I hear what you're saying. Maybe we'll get, if we have time to get that version, let's do it. But I really feel like this is going to work better. I just, having seen all these, having seen the other footage and knowing the story, I think this will work better. And I'm like, okay, well, you're the director, you know the story, rather than, like, bulldozing them or anything like that. Yeah, um, making people feel heard. I mean, that's producing also, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, coming with a producing background really helped me, I think. Oh, yeah. Honestly, yeah. Oh, well, cool. I'm so excited to see that movie. Um, wait, so when if people, because you do all these things now, you're an actor, you're a director, you're a producer, you're a writer. When people say you're at a dinner party or a cocktail party, someone says, hey, what do you do? Is it filmmaking? Uh, in all seriousness, Chris, the most recent thing I've been saying is Jack of all trades, master of none, which yeah. is kind of honestly yeah. how I feel. Yeah. Um, I would say a filmmaker and actor. That's kind of why I like the word filmmaker. Yeah. Because it, because it covers all of it. Um, yeah. yeah. Do you go out on auditions? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're like, yeah. you're, you're um, taking that part seriously, the acting part. I am. I need to take it more seriously. Um, my issue right now is finding, is balancing my time. Uh, the actual main income I make is from renting out my house for film shoots. So <laughs> that's whole, that's like hours of my day as well. Uh, you know, just running that side of things. Yeah. Um, so wait, so let's talk about that. The, the, the reality of like an independent of life. Yeah. filmmaker, you know, like how do you make a living out after film school? Um, well, I'm a jammy bastard, which in English just means lucky person. <laughs> um, what happened was, right, uh, so my grandpa in the UK is getting very old, so he gave some money to me and my brother. We both use it for down payments on houses. Okay. And then I immediately turned the house into the most like film-friendly, production-friendly place possible, listed it on these websites, and have just basically paid off the house and my life. Uh, Ryan's also my tenant, so he calls me a slumlord. Um, so I've just, I, in the same no, way, he, reversed, I've heard him say that about you. It's funny. I, I bet, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> reverse engineered the whole thing so that like the house kind of pays for itself and I use it for film shoots of my own and have people come. It's great. I love it. I meet, reminds me of AFI. I meet all these people all the time. Oh, it's so often I mean, become friends yeah, with. For you're a filmmaker. Now it's, it, they're coming to you to network. Right. And they're like, yeah. Oh, you're also yeah. a producer. You're also an actor. I'm sure you've ended up in some of these projects. A hundred percent. And actually my most recent move was I stuck the AFI diploma on the wall. Um, and that night I'd say 60% of the time now people, people go, you want AFI? So, Whoa! But that's yeah. I've never heard the actual physical diploma meaning something in yeah. the real world. So that's what you need to do. It's this niche group of people who actually, you know, filmmakers basically. Yeah. Um. So and I, yeah, it's really cool meeting these people and like it's not a bad gig being a location person because yeah, the house gets destroyed. I got nothing really valuable in my house to be honest. Uh, yeah. I'm accepting that. Uh. And yeah, I I don't mind it at all. Like you know, it's it's a lot of fun. Have you had um, AFI films there? Yep. <laughs> I had an AFI cycle last year. I'm actually going to try and get more AFI people because I know AFI. That mm -hmm. was great because they were so nice to me because they knew I was friends with Natalie. Oh, got, yeah. They, they, brought me, they brought me muffins. 
they like they were like very nice to me <laughs> it was great that is good it's like uh natalie's watching because i'm watching yeah wow yeah they'll be on their best behavior uh is yeah. there a, a afi friendly rate if someone was like bringing their yeah first of course in there? I'm, I'm, i mean yeah 100 percent. 100 percent. my okay, rates so are really low anyway but yeah i do an even lower rate for afi obviously yeah but that that's a smart i mean you're a, you're a smart producer but in that you know producing your life like you could have done a lot of things with like a you know a lump of money from your family but to do that it, it makes it you mix you know you can be sustainable in this city which isn't cheap um no. and in this industry right it's like you opened a business that is film related in a way where filmmakers come to you yeah i, I don't know i've never heard of that before and it's just so brilliant i'm using your I, word I think, brilliant there you go i i think location is clearly my is the buzzword for me because every single one of my movies has been built around that how can i use this location these things around me to make a movie and in the same way how can i use everything around me to make a living and uh but i i don't i, I hate to i just feel like i'm really lucky like not everyone can that's a really privileged thing to be able to do so no you know. sure sure but it, it it does um i'm just i just think it like it should open people's minds to like there are other ways to do it everybody you know i'm dealing with all these yeah. people that are graduating right now and they're like i want to get the assistant job at the studio and it's like okay there's only there's a this many right but be right. creative there are other ways to that there, there are no rules to this industry we should say one of my buddies recently so i, I don't know if you've heard of peer space and gigster these are like the main websites yeah, yeah. where i get yeah. read he is turning one of his rooms in his apartment which he rents into a podcast studio and he's going to rent them out on Gigster and Peerspace because of having seen me do this. I'm like, awesome. So you don't even have to own a place. Yep. You yep. know, if it's low impact like that, that's totally That is so smart. Workable. You just need some sound insulation, a couple of these mics, and yeah. And yeah. They're, everybody's doing podcasts <laughs> as we yeah. are living uh, in, well, one right here. in one right now. <laughs> exactly. when, when, when I start doing one, that means everyone's done one. Uh, <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So what's the, like, what's the schedule? What's your like daily life? Or is it, I mean, I'm sure it's a little bit different every day, but how do you plan a day? Um, so I might have like two or three film rentals a week, possibly up to, you know, in terms of rentals, of the house there might just be a few hours. I, I can have as, as few as like two hours for like a pickup scene for a short film or a music video to like three or four days straight features or more. Um, and then all the rest of the time I am either, well, if I'm not, if I'm not in post-production, then I go, I, I can't work from home. I don't know how you feel about this. I go to the local coffee shop where they, I basically, I basically budget myself like $6 a day to buy teas yeah. as my we work. Um, yeah. And I work there and I often meet people there and I'm writing, working on the, the next project. Um, I've got to a point where the, the location stuff kind of pays for everything else. I live pretty frugally, but you know, obviously hopefully some of these movies start making money too. And then, hopefully eventually I can wean off that stuff. Um, and then right now I'm in post on a feature. I'm in a weird place because we, because of the holidays and the, the, me going away, I went home and the editor went home. So we've actually had a two month break from editing mm -hmm. and I really need to like jump back in. Um, that was the feature I was in. So it's very hard for me to be objective about it. So I've really tried to get as much feedback as possible. Um, and, but it's tricky also that because, one too? Yes, but again, yeah, I did. Um, I'm, but I'm in the movie. One thing that bothered, one thing I was like, you know what? If, if someone else, some actor is going to be, if I'm going to be directing and not holding the camera, I'm going to go nuts. Cause I'm going to be like, oh my God, he's not doing the found. It's a, oh, sorry. It's a found footage movie. Oh. So it's a found footage movie. So the, okay. so the, the lead actors, the two of us are the two camera people. I'm probably doing it more than the other person. So I knew what I wanted. Right. And then I got Derek Matarangas, AFI, AF, great right. AFI guy. He's on monitor. And I'm like, dude, you are the visual guardian of this movie. I can't be watching monitor. I want to be acting. Tell me where it's gone wrong. We can shot list it, whatever. But like, you, you know, did we get what we needed? Do we, do we have everything? And honestly, found footage, it, I, I got in, I watched a few recently before, well, before what, making, writing this script. It was written as a normal conventional movie. Watched some found footage and it was like, I think this could work as found footage. So I rewrote the whole script for found footage. Hmm. Um, you can steal like crazy. I'm not going to say the AFI, sorry, not AFI. We didn't steal at AFI. I'm not going to say the LA locations that we stole at, but boy. I don't know how much you have to pay for these. Um, well, look, that's what you and, have to do on, on, on these low budget movies. You have to. Yeah. yeah. But for found footage, like no one's going to, we're not even going to get in. Like, it looks like we're just YouTubers. You could be on we your are. phone and grab Our characters are YouTube. Yeah. Well, exactly. Our, 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 
our characters were YouTubers, but they have like a good enough channel where they have like a nice camera. So we actually had a proper camera with shooting oh, eyes. Nice. And then the monster is a scarecrow. Because I feel like scarecrows haven't got any love in horror. You ever seen a scarecrow yeah. horror movie? No, but like, they get... scarecrow was a Batman villain, but like it's a great iconic, right. like, yeah, it, yeah, it should be. I'm so, that's so, so cool. So my new thing is I'm trying to build, you're literally the first person I'm telling this to, I'm trying to build an independent horror franchise with a scarecrow monster. So I'm aiming as high as you possibly can, to be I honest. I love it. But that's my goal is to, to have a basically this character be fed, you know, become a uh, horror fans. They know this character. People dress up for Halloween. That would be a dream. Yeah. And there might be two, three, four of these movies. I, my character kind of gets killed off in the first movie. <laughs> so not much room for me. But you never know. I could come back Pretty from cool. one, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Your twin that we didn't so, know about in the first one. Yeah. Um, exactly. Well, and there's also like everybody comes in with like some form of knowledge of a scarecrow, which is nice, right? You don't have to like explain too much. You're like, oh, a scarecrow. There you go. Boom. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, and it was just all my friends. Uh, we sh- I got a load. There's a quite a big cast because there's a whole cult that worships this scarecrow. So I cast like literally all my friends who who have it. So they love it. They, you know what I mean. And it, yeah, all my friends who are on the film. It's just is this Ryan a lot of like out helping in, out uh, farmland because of a scarecrow. It's all shot at my nearly all shot at my house. I know it's going to sound crazy. Like, how is this possible? Yeah, why is there a scarecrow in your house? I know you can't tell me everything, but the idea is I won't. I'll tell you. Back in back in the nineteen, so until like 1945, the valley was still like 70 percent agricultural, That's and cool. even like into the 60s. Um, so this cult has been worshiping this scarecrow for since the 1800s. We actually had a uh, the very first scene of the movie was set in the 1800s. We didn't shoot it. We may shoot it. That's a pl- one of the things we need mm. to decide. And whilst the city's grown up around this area, this is a fictional area of LA called Oak Bridge, uh, they have con- retained control and they still worship this scarecrow. But it, but it essentially lives within now an urban area, but it's brought them a lot of prosperity and this kind of thing. And they just, they sacrifice people to the scarecrow. This scarecrow goes after people who are not uh, authentic. It goes after people who are fake. I was like, LA, perfect. <laughs> We've got these two... You, we've itself. got these two YouTube, yeah. YouTube TikToky type people who are completely full of crap, particularly my character. Yeah, and the it's all kind of controlled by this cult. They they have the police in their pockets. They like can do you know they can do what they want. Yeah. Um. And the scarecrow, they find the scarecrow in the backyard, and like what the fuck is it? You know what I mean? What is? And then it, but it, it kind of there's a sort of explanation as to why it's there and blah blah blah. The realtor's in on it. So I, I'm curious, no one, none of the feedbacks I've asked been like, why is there a scarecrow there? Mm-hmm. But I can see why you would think that immediately. Well, um, yeah, I'm sure when I watch it, it'll all make sense. But and then you explaining it, I'm like, that's a great, that's a great backstory. Also, I'm a Valley native, so I, I do know that background. Oh, I think a lot of people that's know, awesome. like, well, a lot of people yeah. know Hollywood was like all, all orange groves, you know, back in the day. So exactly. that yeah. makes sense. So and I love the kind of like little Easter egg fun tie in that you were a YouTuber. Now you're yeah. playing a YouTuber again. There's like a little built-in yeah. audience there. Like don't, don't discount yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so you had someone we'll playing see. a scarecrow like that's in shots and stuff. Yeah. So we had, we had, so the stunt, the main, the stunt coordinator on dread space, he's like a six foot four big dude. He's in the scarecrow outfit. Every time there wasn't a real stunt, Ryan Scringe is our scarecrow. <laughs> That way, we didn't have to bring the stunt guy in just to basically. You went from be a big double. dude to Ryan Scarin? To Ryan. I mean, no offense, and Ryan. Ryan but... Ryan, well, Ryan on tiptoes, you know, ah. kind of bagging it out. I think we like, threw some pillows. We also had like a man. We had a mannequin. Alex, oh, Alex Dixon, production designer. My very first production designer on my Psycho One, week one, was the production designer on this. I love it. And it, she's awesome. She's awesome. I love it. It shows that so, you keep relationships, which is like a very key part of being a good producer. I try. I, 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 I really struggle when i lose friends i take it very personally yeah so it's a it's a it's a blessing and a curse <laughs> yeah i feel the same i'm always like why doesn't that person like what? and then you want to win them over yeah um right dude that's awesome i i if you want to do like a, a test screening at afi let's do it really yeah we'll get that oh little theater and we'll we'll uh you know pack it full of some well you bring some 100 people, we'll some people yeah i would genuinely 100 percent be down for that thank you yeah seriously that's, uh, Sounds that, awesome. That was, you know, you asked me earlier what the biggest thing I learned at AFI. I take it back what I said earlier about the phone calls, although that is num- that's a close second. Test screenings. 
the number of indie films I've kind of helped out on where they won't do a test screening. The, the excuse is then out of the money, time, resources. The real reason I'm convinced is they're terrified of feedback yeah. that will crush them. But then they're only going to get that feedback later when the movie's already done and released and it's too late. Yeah. I will I will take the brutal feedback, honestly. Yeah. Give it to me yeah. now. I will say that, that you know, it, that's one thing AFI gets right in that they prime you for that with narrative workshop, which is like getting used to listening to feedback on a finish, on a quote, finished film, right? A very yeah. quick, you know, scheduled finished film. And then they have you test your thesis, uh, which, yeah, it's always scary. Narrative workshop is emotional and like, you know, traumatizing. And then the test screening for your thesis, it, but but that it mimics the real world because they do do that. But it also it only helps your film if you listen to like a, a a note that's being or feedback that's being repeated, right? One hundred percent. I remember we did yeah. it for was it Ryan's first movie? I were you part of that one, the Alien comedy one? You, yeah, yeah, we did it for that one, and you actually got us the little AFI theater for this project, Project Dorothy, the one that you we just talked about, the sci-fi. Oh, that we did okay, I remember days. getting the film. Okay, I didn't know it was for that. Cool. Yeah, well, both. There was one for both. So yeah, I think but I remember got, we did were, the big theater for the for the. You did the big. You did the big one for useless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I I went to that one. Um, that's cool. That's the one yeah. that I felt like had heart. Had heart. You know, it's a flawed movie, but it, you feel the fun and the joy and the heart of it. Yeah, you feel Ryan. Yeah, in that, totally. Honestly. And there was just yeah. like, I just remember like everybody came out because they all liked you guys. And then it was like, there was, just, it was like a, yeah, I mean, obviously it wasn't perfect. And that was the whole point of it. You know, it was a rough, it was a, it was a rough cut, but it was, there yeah. was so much love in that, in that room and everybody wanting to help, like try to, you know, make it better, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that's cool. So l- last, th- last couple of things I'll, I'll, I'll ask it. Yeah. Do you have yeah. a mentor in your life that you that you found early on or at school that is still a big part of your success um even if it's ryan because, so yeah <laughs> i wouldn't give him that much credit, the, but. i'm gonna uh the producer who convinced me to come to la mm. definitely was my first but he's not he's a we as soon as i got here it felt like i drifted because he's a finance guy who funds movies doesn't really know much more than that not 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 that's not what I mean like he's just not he's not necessarily a creator creative yeah. person, as creative of a person um i my yeah ryan and my friends around me um betsy i got to put it up put it up. i think it's a collection of people i don't i wish i could say i had one i love mark Plas from a distance yeah um got to give my old man credit like yeah. the way he operates he's all about like work culture and keeping everyone happy and that to me is really a good, valuable lesson that I've learned. Um, yeah, my dad, my dad, Ryan. I feel like Chris, you, you, you were an inspiration to all of us. You have a very. Well, I was talking about this to someone yesterday uh, at dinner. You, um, it's the attitude of um, not being phased by things that are outside of your control. Because the Jurassic World, for example, terrible. Not the best movie ever made. There's a quote in it where the guy says the key to a happy life is to accept you're never really in control. And I feel like you always were just like, just why are you worried about this? I don't know. Is that fair? That That's very fair. And I've, I've never really thought of that, but like when you say it, it's like so crystal clear that, yeah, I, 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 when I see it happen to other people, I, I try to like, you know, address it and be like, like it's, you're gonna, everyone's going to forget about it because a lot of times it's about like, what do people think about me in this moment? Right. And mm, I, yeah. I've, I, I've always tried to remind myself they're going to forget about this in 30 seconds, in five minutes, in 10 minutes, you know? And if you can go through your life like that, there's so much freedom in, in being a little more authentic, you know, not, not doing things to, to try to, you know, impress people or make, you know, or to get people to like you. And I say that, as someone that's always trying to like, you know, entertain people and get people to laugh. But I, I feel like th- it, that also comes from something else, which is also, you know, just, I don't, I, to me, you know, I've, I've always wanted to like, you know, make movies and everything. And I, I do stuff on the side, but I've always done it at, uh, from a, I've always thought like I found joy in it. Right. And I, and I, yeah. I think most filmmakers do it because it's fun. Right. It's like a, the best excuse in the world to hang out with your friends. Right. You know, and you're, you're, you are living it in the the most like in the most classic way right you're like that's you're the role model for that 
And so when I see, right. like, especially like fellows and they're stressing out over thesis or the production office saying this and all the, all the, right. all the stuff is like crushing their soul. I'm like, why did you want to do this? It's supposed to be fun. And I, I, that's, that's the thing that I always try to like embody and, and inspire in people. So that, and what you said. So I thank you for that. Cause I never well, really thought. <laughs> well, I think the fact I, you're right, you are like that. And that was a nice juxtaposition from all of the stress of everything else at AFI. And I get it. We're spending a lot of money. There's a lot yeah. of, a lot of, it was, it was like being in high school. I went to an all boys school for high school. So <laughs> I felt like I went to a uh, mixed high school, like, you know, girls and boys high school at AFI. It was, there's a lot of, oh, a lot of yeah. chatting, a lot of like negativity. And I'm like, really? I don't know. And I think it was all blown up to be honest. Like, I think most people were like really kind and everything, but uh, yeah, we just had some a good time. And that was, that yeah. mentality is what, what I felt like I had on my thesis, which just made my year compared to so many other people so much more relaxed and it and and just fun fun yeah. is the word yeah we should be fun yeah the, making them fun. should be fun watching them should be fun it, it should all be fun so like let's yeah. just leave it with that message it should let everybody have more fun uh i'll ask you this just as last thing how has it been yeah. cool to see that augie you know having his first feature come out 100 percent, 100 percent. i went to see it at afi um yeah. yeah, it was super exciting. Not just the fact that Oggy was on it, but so many of my other close friends were on it too. Producing it, shooting it. Uh, um, yeah, I, I um, every time I hear that someone from our year or anyone I know, even vaguely, is making something or has made something, I am so excited to go see it. I, oh my goodness. And I do feel like that's one thing I'll give myself credit for. I think there's a security, like a lack of insecurity in that. Because I think yeah. some people get insecure when they hear that someone's made something it's not a competition there's room for everybody um so let's all just rise together to be a cliche i guess but i just no, want to no, see but everyone it, there's else so much that. super people, exciting people compare and despair and they, they they see someone got success and they think like that was my shot you know and there are a million shots it, it's it's not a zero-sum game and I, I was just like try to force people to celebrate everyone else's success you know it's yeah. so i don't yeah. know why it's so hard for people but you know it, it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't take away from what you're doing. I, I think we've never been in a, in a, we've never been in a time where comparison is more readily presented to us because of social media and everything like that. And like, you look at yeah. someone's Instagram, you're like, they look so happy. They might have, they might be depressed. They you could have all sorts of horrible things going on. They feel like they need to present themselves in a certain way. And then you hear, yeah. anyway, we could just get a whole other conversation. No, but, I know. Uh, I know. No, we're saying the same thing. Know. Yeah. But you're right. It is a social yeah. media. Just, is you know is is gas on that fire so um yeah hey man this was awesome uh and i think we're just yeah, barely scratched the surface because the next time i want to hear all about the bo all boys school uh a lot of stories there i'm sure <laughs> oh my goodness yeah <laughs> or just make a horror film about it uh yeah yeah <laughs> so hit me up when you're when you're ready to um do a test screening because uh i'm definitely going to sit through that i want to watch it and i can't wait to see it and you're and but you must have turned a profit on this twenty five thousand dollar movie right Please tell me. Um, not yet. You will. I know. I I think we will on this one. I really do. Uh, it was twenty five thousand for production, so a lot more for post. Right. I'll say that. And then okay. Daniel Harris came in later as we had paid it. But I, you know, the money that we spent wasn't very was very much to lose to start with, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and I do think now a lot of these indie movies will make they kind of they might not break even for the first year or two, but they will break even, and they will then make money. You know what I mean? Like. That's what I, I've seen from people who might have released a movie a couple of years ago and now they're starting to see money. But you know what? That's awesome. That's an extra 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks a month to their, that they can use for paying their mortgage or whatever it might be. Yeah. So, you know. Cool, man. We'll keep making them. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, man. I'll talk to you soon. Maybe I'll see you at poker night. Oh, dude, every Tuesday. Every Tuesday here. Tuesday? Every Tuesday? Tuesday? Every single... We haven't missed one yet. Good group of people. A lot of film people. The people you probably actually there's not that many AFIs, so you actually won't have to yeah. like put up with a bunch of you know AFI nonsense. What's the buy-in? Five bucks. Five oh, bucks really? buy-in. It's not. We're not. We're not elitist, man. That is like the AFI the stuff, nonprofit crap. There you go. And then we you can buy back in another five if you want to like you know if you, yeah. you want to go nuts and then you can buy back in again. All right, five bucks. I can handle that, and and it'll it'll be practice because I it's haven't played in a while. So it's yeah, it's a good crowd. We'd love All to right, have man. you. I'm in. All right, bro. All right, cool. thanks, for, thanks for spending the time on this. This was fun. Thanks for having me, man.